In the world of spices, India is at the center. No country has done more to shape the way they are used. In return, spices have shaped the course of India's history. Powerful outsiders drawn by spices came first to trade, then to conquer, then to rule. Many generations of British administrators grew up in India. They were given a taste of magnificence beyond anything they could dream of at home. But when these gentlemen retired to their English suburbs, their taste buds, conditioned by the stimulating rigors of Indian cooking, needed exercise. Seasoned athletes of the culinary peaks, they found British food rather undemanding. A blend of ground spices remedied the deficiency, and curry powder was born. Not so much Indian cooking as a convenient way for those retired English gentlemen to recapture the taste of their youth. Not that they wanted to eat curry at every meal. The 600 million people of India do want to eat it at every meal. Those in the south eat rice. Those in the north eat wheat. There are those who only cook in clarified butter, those who cook in coconut oil. But they share a passion for highly spiced dishes, which the rest of the world, at least, calls curry. It was under the palm trees of the south that the word originated. The Tamils used the word keri to describe a dish with sauce. So how does an Indian curry begin? In this classical village kitchen, as many as 15 spices are put into a mortar and ground to a fine powder. Fry crushed onions, garlic, and fresh ginger. And this is called wet masala. Next is the turn of the newly pounded spice mixture, supplemented by other individual spices if necessary. To complete the curry, add vegetables and water. This typical process is repeated by millions of Indians every day. The skill of their cooking lies in a blending of tastes. A standard curry powder would not suffice here. It will make all these curries taste the same. <laughs> Delhi, the capital of India, the meeting place for the food of every region. Among the streets and bazaars of the old town is the Delhi Spice Market. Within this small area, a huge volume of trading makes it the world's busiest. You'll find no ready mixed curry powders here. Seven spices matter more than all the others. Chilies, the spice that puts the fire into Indian food. But early cookbooks never mentioned them. The really fiery dishes everyone considers typically Indian didn't exist until the Portuguese brought chilies 500 years ago. Dried red chilies are used in specially large quantities in the south of India. Chili hot food makes you sweat. When the sweat evaporates, the body begins to feel cool. Clever that, hmm? You have to be very careful with ready ground spices. They don't hold their flavor for long unless they are properly sealed. Fine black pepper. It is grown in the south. Chilies are so much stronger, but fresh black pepper has a delicacy of flavor lurking behind its bite. This Sikh buyer can tell its quality just from the feel. Too heavy means too damp, he'd be paying for water. In bargaining, the voices say one thing, but the hands signal the real price. Mm. 
Cumin is one of the most popular spices in India. Many people call it the curry spice. The seeds can be lightly roasted and ground to mellow their flavour. They are delicious as seasoning for a dish already cooked. A dish like chaat, a meal of deep fried whole wheat fritters with boiled chickpeas and yoghurt. Coriander. This is the most basic spice in India, even though its homeland is the Mediterranean. The seeds, when ground, help to thicken sauces. In India, flour is never used for this purpose. They have a warm, fruity taste. The leaves of the coriander plant and the ripening seeds. These leaves are every bit as popular as the seeds, chopped and scattered as garnish on almost every curry dish. The pleasant sweetness of much of Indian cooking comes from this spice, green cardamom. It grows easily, protected from the sun by large leafy tropical trees. The pickers bend double to reach the seed pods that grow near the ground. The whole pod is the spice. The flavour is in the milky sap of the dark seeds. A part of this crop will go to the Middle East. Anyone who has drunk coffee in Arab countries will know the perfume of cardamom. And this scent lingers in good curry powders. The pods spend 24 hours in the strong heat of the drying rooms. Once dried, they are a veritable storehouse of flavour. Bitter tasting fenugreek. In curry powder, these seeds give a pleasant smell and bring out the flavor of the other spices. No Indian cook would use them until they have been roasted to a dark brown to reduce their bitterness. Botanical pictures are an attractive byproduct of the world's interest in spices. Fenugreek attracted a lot of attention, perhaps because its leaves as well as its seeds are used. Seeds for the spice mixture, leaves in the salad. turmeric. This spice gives the deep yellow colour to curry. It has an aromatic tang as well, but the colour comes first. It is Indian cookery's most widely used spice. It's the underground stem of this plant that matters. First it must be boiled, then left in the sun for weeks to dry. Many Indians like to buy their spices whole rather than ground, but not always turmeric. It's so tough. So, these seven spices, ground or unground, roasted or fresh, are the Indian cook's most valuable aids. But they're only the start. At least 25 seeds and spices are sold by the retailers of the Delhi spice market. Housewives go to the same merchant regularly. They trust him to supply the finest quality seeds, whole or ground, just to the right coarseness. In Delhi, good spices live alongside fine vegetables. The cook's art in mixing spices only succeeds if their quality is good in the first place. This woman has brought a countryside tradition to the town. She is a freelance spice grinder. Today, a middle-class housewife needs someone to prepare garam masala. Garam masala is the name of a spice mixture the only mix regularly found in an Indian kitchen. These ground from what Indians call the heat-giving spices. 
Garam masala does have similar ingredients to curry powder and maybe what inspired it, but this masala is used differently. It is just the final embellishment for a dish. For chicken garam masala, the cooking process begins just like that for many other Indian curries. In this wet masala, crushed onions, fresh ginger and garlic are softened in clarified butter. The indefinable quality of Indian food means that spices are not measured, they are somehow felt. Today, in go whole cumin seeds, a spoon of ground turmeric, even more ground coriander, a little ground chilli, and salt to taste. This cook doesn't feel bound to mix them together in advance or even to use them all ground. She is painting her own rich culinary picture. Enough water is added to prevent the spices and the wet masala from sticking to the pan and burning. Now tomatoes, the mark of the North Indian cook. The fruits with their skins on. It thickens the gravy and adds colour. Then it's the turn of the chicken, always cooked without its skin. As it cooks, the flavours sink right into the flesh so that the whole dish is full and well balanced. Whole spices play an important part with rice. Clarified butter is heated to smoking point. An array of whole spices are tossed in. The cumin is followed by green cardamom, cloves, cinnamon, and black pepper. In the heat, the spices split and surrender up discrete quantities of their goodness to the oil. Then the rice is added. Perhaps following an ancient instruction, wash it thrice for the gods, twice for guests, and once for our ancestors. This is the beginning of a simple pilau. Water is added. The grains are left to drink up the water and the spicy butter. There, there they are, the whole spices. Sensational flashes of taste when you bite into them. To finish the chicken curry, some chopped coriander leaves, and at last, the garam masala a sprinkling of gold, a final seasoning to give the dish the fresh taste of spices. Once the rice was most of the meal, curry was but a flavouring. Now it's often the other way around. Witness tonight's meal of chicken garam masala with the rice as well as potato and aubergine curry. What makes all these dishes? The spices. Indian street corner you will find curry. But street corner kiosks sell spicy packages that outsiders will consider a bizarre supplement to curry. Pan is the name. It is a mild stimulant and a digestive and it's everywhere. It's made up from the leaf of black pepper, 
a range of digestive spices, along with a finely chopped areca nut and the red katesho root. The end of every meal is marked by the chewing of the pan. Diwali, the famous festival of lights. It's a month-long celebration of the homecoming of the god Ram from exile. And it's the time for another addition to the curries of India, the popular sweetmeats. But first, to welcome the goddess Lakshmi into the house, families paint their thresholds. Even here, the curry spices play their part. Turmeric, for example, gives the yellow color. And lights of every kind guide the goddess to the door. After all, Lakshmi is the goddess of wealth and beauty. Metai, the sweet meats containing cinnamon, cardamom, milk and sugar, can be eaten at any time of the day. And there are plenty to choose from. Halva, ladus, burfis, koa, some made by professionals, some at home. The rule in India seems to be that if you can eat it, it's flavoured with a spice. For this one, milk curd is pressed around cardamom seeds. Gulab jamun, as it is called, is then deep fried. Finally, these glowing orbs are soaked in a rich sugar syrup. This Delhi family is making 500 wicks for 500 clay lamps to decorate the outside of their house. Mustard oil is the fuel burned, but they are interrupted by the visit of an uncle. Happy Diwali! Thank you, thank you. It's so sweet. It's so sweet. It's Time to spread sweetness and light. No one has ever seen such foods since the cook of divine contrivance had placed the hot dish of the sun on the table of the heavens. This is a description of the food of the Mughal invaders in the 17th century. Where Indian curries had been simple, the Mughals made them sumptuous. Where the food had been sumptuous, it became splendid with great style and good taste. They so influenced the cuisine that in the north, it is difficult to find a totally Indian dish. The palace of Jaipur, the home of the Maharaja, a place associated with luxury. The former rulers acted as generals for the armies of the Mughal emperors. Tonight, the Maharaja is giving a banquet. The centerpiece is to be one of the Mughals' greatest contributions to Indian food, the biryani. Not a spicy stew like a curry, but a lavish dish combining rice, meat and spices. The head of the household instructs the chef to make a kuchi biryani. First, take the finest basmati rice and soak it. Then mingle pieces of the best lamb with fine spices and almonds, pistachio nuts and Persian dates. Pour in yogurt especially made for the purpose. Stir well and allow the meat to marinate for three to four hours. Seal the pan to create a kind of oven once the raw rice has been mixed in. The dough paste ensures that the flavors and aromas cannot escape. As the cook patiently puts the finishing touches, maybe he reflects on the great tradition he follows. His predecessors were hired according to the amount of a certain dish they alone were able to prepare. There was the 200-person pilau cook, the 50-person spicy meat cook, and none of them followed a recipe. To the Indian, cooking is intuitive, indeed almost philosophical. The uncooked biryani is left to mature on the fire with a low heat above and below to coax out the finest flavors.
Upstairs, the Maharaja welcomes his guests. This is a rare gathering of royalty, a happy party, but reflecting life more as it was than as it is. These kebabs are another reminder that Indian food, while dependent on spices, is far more varied than the word curry evokes. Silver talis are put out. The biryani in the middle is surrounded by little bowls of different curries, some vegetarian, some meat, allowing the guests to follow their fancy. In the kitchen, more biryani is taken from the fire. The guests settle down to their feast. The second helping is decorated with gulab jamun wrapped in pure silver leaf, a symbol of edible extravagance. <laughs> this creation lives up to the highest Mughal standard. With it, go a range of curries containing other Mughal blessings, saffron, almonds, cream, and fine apricots. It was a similar dish that caused a British visitor in the 17th century Mughal court to exclaim, it is the most admired dainty with which they stuffed themselves to the throat and they received no hurt, it being so well prepared to the stomach. <laughs> Ever since, foreigners have admired and envied these people for their simple yet sophisticated talent with food and spices. <laughs> Perhaps in time, even the ubiquitous pan will be coveted. So, however insignificant curry powder may seem in comparison to these feasts, it had an important place. It was a key for people who wanted to recall the colour, the flavour and the variety of Indian food, but who were too inexperienced to do it themselves. Curry powder was the next best thing to packing up a whole spice market in their baggage. In Britain, it's still used to give variety to everyday eating. It has inspired a special British kind of curry. And the popularity of curry in many other countries shows that the commercial blends were well judged. In Jamaica, three influences have combined, local, British, and that of Indian settlers, to produce curried goat as a national dish. and curry spices have become a passion in Japan. In Shinjuku, Tokyo's entertainment center, this restaurant indulges the Japanese craze for curry eating. The British gentlemen who first popularized the powder did more than they ever knew to create a culinary bridge between India and the rest of the world. Before you go, you come a waltzing material. 